So I'm going to adjust our scripture reading for the last, uh, the Acts verse, just a little bit. We're going to read Acts uh, 2, 1 through 13, and then I'm going to pick up at the end of the chapter in 43 through 47. Uh, and also, if hopefully, if you, this should have been next to your um, bulletin. If you don't have one, I think there might be some in the back for you. Um, uh, we'll be using these later in the sermon. Uh, but let's open our minds and hearts to what God is saying through the scriptures today. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. That was those who were present with the disciples. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem, and at this sound the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our native languages, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and the visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. In our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? And we'll jump to the end of the, the chapter. Awe came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. And they would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. This is the word of God for the people of God, and we can say, thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Holy Spirit, Open our eyes to your presence. Rushing through this room like a mighty wind. Or whispering softly in our hearts. We're standing on the edge of what's next. Calling us towards hope and loving action. Help these words. By your power, speak to us and transform us so that we may point to the word made flesh, Jesus Christ. Amen. So she suggested to me, this friend of mine, why don't you try speaking in tongues? My friend's comment was kind of half a joke and, and half a serious suggestion. You see, she and I... Uh, we're in Nicaragua, and I was trying to keep a 12-year-old boy interested in the relay races that we had planned for all these kids that day. Becker, that was the boy's name, was more interested in trying to steal some cake from the kitchen than in playing games with the other residents of Mustard Seed Orphanage. And I, who had an A in, in Biblical Hebrew, and I had passed all my high school French classes, was regretting that never in my life while I lived in Florida had taken a class in Spanish. Now, I'm not sure Spanish would have helped me too much. Becker was pretty much a nonverbal communicator, but there was this big communication gap between me and Becker. Some of you may have heard me talk about the Mustard Seed Orphanage that I'm mentioning here. Um, there's two of them in Nicaragua. And between 2010 and 2016, I visited them almost every year. And I led trips of multiple college students from FSU to go visit and, and get to know that beautiful community. Mustard Seed was a safe place for kids who have, and is a safe place for kids who have developmental issues and come from troubled pasts. And some of the kids get to grow up and live on their own, and many remain in the Mustard Seed community all their lives. 
So my friend who I was with in this moment, she wasn't trying to be snarky. She literally thought that if I just trusted in the Holy Spirit, I would be able to just speak Spanish, even though I'd never taken a course in it, or that I would be able to communicate in some magical way with this young man. And if God willed it, Becker and I would understand each other. I wonder if, like me, many of us have a strained relationship with the day of Pentecost. Maybe you've been to a church where people are falling out in the spirit and babbling in ways that you don't understand. And like me, when this happened around me, you were confused and uncomfortable and not really encouraged as they say you're supposed to be. But my hope today is not to belittle those faith traditions that practice this day a little differently, but to offer us a way of seeing past just the act of speaking in tongues to a bigger miracle that occurs on Pentecost. You see, many would believe that speaking in tongues was the miracle of Pentecost, and they believe that the church should be able to call upon that gift at will whenever we demand it, whenever we need to be able to do that, that we can just say, Holy Spirit, give me this gift. But the disciples in this story are not sitting in that room demanding that the Spirit come down. In fact, they are waiting for the Spirit to come. Last we heard, Peter's trying to order the disciples and make sure everything is neat for this coming of the Spirit. And if you leave here with one lesson today, I I need you to hear this one lesson. The Holy Spirit is God. It is one of the triune persons of God. And just like you and I have no control over God, just like we understand God to be omnipotent and all-loving, we do not control the Holy Spirit. You can repeat that to yourself if you need to. We do not control the Holy Spirit, but we receive the Spirit who lives in the midst of us. The same Spirit who was there at the beginning helping hover over the waters before creation. The same Spirit that raised dry bones. And the same Spirit that calls us sons and daughters of a living God. We receive the Spirit who lives amidst us. So the disciples didn't ask to speak all those different languages. Again, they were sitting there waiting. They were overcome by the Spirit. They were compelled to leave this room where they were hiding and begin sharing God's word of love with people from all over the world. Pentecost is not about how the church controls God's power. It's about how the power of God compels the church to move and to speak. Besides, when we read this story... I don't think we should see the disciples speaking in foreign languages as the act of God's power alone in this story. The Holy Spirit doesn't cause Pentecost to happen as kind of a look at me moment, as a look what I can do moment. It's far more practical than that. Did you hear the list of who was living in Jerusalem when this happened? I'm going to read it again, and it's quite lengthy. Parthians, Medes, Elamites, Mesopotamians, Phrygians, Pamphylians, Arabians, Egyptians, Libyans, Romans, Cretans, Greek. And if, you, if, if I had given you a map, you would see how many people we're talking about. These are people from over a thousand miles away from Jerusalem, which is quite a distance to travel in the ancient world. Some of these people probably traveled two months to be in Jerusalem on foot, uphill, both ways, in the snow. The Holy Spirit isn't showing off here. It's helping the disciples speak to those who are present in front of them, to this diverse group of people. And even still, maybe it's not the speaking of tongues that is the miracle of Pentecost. At least not in my opinion as I stand here before you today. When I hear all those places and look at a map and think of the history I know of those places, I am reminded of all the possible divisions between each of those groups the violent and competitive histories that that color in that map of those places. You see, Judea and Jerusalem was a crossroads for many empires. They would fight over it for trade interest interest, because it had access to the sea. It was often conquered by emperor after emperor who was striving for their power, for their superiority in the ancient Near East. And the Holy Spirit, who descends in this moment, is trying to join all of these competing people together into one church, inviting them all to join in the Jesus movement at the same time, 
you can't look past their violent histories, but the Holy Spirit is trying to move them past those violent histories and join them in God's loving family. On Pentecost, the Holy Spirit shows us that the church is building, that the church that God is building, a church that fulfills Joel's prophecy where no matter your gender or your background or your socioeconomic status, the Holy Spirit is poured upon you. And that means that God's presence is joined to you and even to those who you might have a fraught history with. The miracle of Pentecost is that God's desire for this kind of church, God's desire for a church of diverse people from different backgrounds, manifests itself in the disciples. The Holy Spirit manifests itself in the disciples because now they are asked to stop planning their own personal things and join the Holy Spirit's work of joining this diverse group of people. Theologian Willie Jennings says, The divine one God wants people, and God draws us in to that wanting, this intensified giving, this feverish giving that feels not only the urgent need, but the divine wanting. God wants people in God's family And by the Spirit, God draws us into God's desire for them. The miracle of Pentecost is that the church will be made up of people who lay aside their desire for uniformity, for sameness, for their own interests. Pentecost is about laying those things aside and taking up God's desire for a global, diverse, countercultural community that can share in all things and look to the goodwill of all people. The church will desire the unity that the Holy Spirit desires, and no one, not and not a, a unity that erases differences, but joins them in love. I'm curious if that resonates with us today. A church that doesn't erase differences but unites them in love. A church that is compelled by the Spirit to desire for our neighbor the way that God loves them and desires to be joined with them a church that lays aside its personal desires and instead picks up God's desires. So when I think back to my time in Nicaragua, I never did end up speaking in tongues to Becker. I never spoke Spanish fluently, though I I did learn a little bit while I was down there. I had to find other ways to communicate with these children who I loved and their, and their caretakers who I loved and their, and their extended family and mustard seed who I love and care about with my friend Julia, Fernando, Omar. The Holy Spirit did do a work, though, in me in Nicaragua, not because I suddenly spoke Spanish, but because I found in my spirit this desire to join with these people with whom I shared very little in common. We were joined as siblings into the family of God, and suddenly my heart cared for them the way I imagined God's heart might. Not that I could fulfill God's love, but that I could be an agent of it in that moment, and that they could love me as God loves me in some small way. I was called outside of myself, outside of my interests, into the life of another. Friends, the Holy Spirit is still calling the church to speak in tongues today, but not in the way that we might think. Maybe speaking in tongues is about finding the way to be there for your neighbor who you know nothing about. Maybe speaking in tongues is about showing compassion to that person with whom you feel you have very little in common with. Maybe speaking in tongues is about laying aside your agenda for a moment to see the need of the person next to you. Speaking to the heart of someone else, no matter how big the divide or gap may be, with the love of God and God's desire for that person. So you have this little card with you. It's not perfectly made. But the question I want us to leave with, and I'd invite you to take some time meditating on and maybe writing on here, and if you have an answer today, I'd love for you to leave it in the offering bin on your way out is who is the Spirit inviting me to love? Who is the Spirit inviting us to speak in tongues to in this world? Is it inviting us to speak in the tongues of those who experience poverty, 
is inviting us to speak for those who experience injustice or racism or classism or xenophobia? Is it inviting us to speak in the tongues of those who experience incarceration as so many disciples did in the books of Acts? In the book of Acts, is inviting us to speak to those whose heart language is different than our own, to speak to those who love differently than us, to speak to those who may be struggling with addiction, to speak to our friends who are well off, who need to be challenged, to let go of their agenda, to speak to the young if we are old, to speak to the old if we are young, the popular or the alone, the depressed, the angry, the joy-filled. What tongue is the Holy Spirit inviting us to speak into? What desire of God's for another person is the Holy Spirit inviting us to join? The miracle of Pentecost is what the speaking in tongues accomplishes, the end of that book. When the church body can be together and share all things, whether they be from Egypt or Mesopotamia or Rome or Maryland or Florida or to the ends of the earth, the miracle is that that community, as diverse and complicated as it can be, would be united to one another in the spirit. Who is God calling us to speak in tongues to, to speak in love to? So uh, our council has been meeting and talking about trying to do some visioning this summer. I'm going to give some more information about that in the announcements next week. But the idea is that we as St. Paul are preparing for kind of a new chapter with the pandemic uh, restrictions lessening as we move into a new school year in the fall. And so we're going to be doing some visioning, but I would argue that the first part of visioning is not what we want as a church, but who is the Spirit compelling us to join with as a church? As we begin this process, we'll have times to meet together or to fill out a survey or to, or, or to, to workshop some of those ideas. The question is not, what do I want, but what is the Spirit preparing and compelling me to do? So it all boils down to this question. Who is the Spirit inviting me to love and to unite with? Would you pray with me? Spirit of God, sent by God out of love. Empower us to be the church. In the same way the disciples were compelled to move past the upper room and share your love with those in the streets, no matter who they were, no matter what complicated histories existed there. Compel us, inspire us, transform us, Holy Spirit, with the love of our neighbor in the way that you define that word. Give us the voice to speak to them. Give us the ears to hear you speaking through them. And bring us to that place of unity where we set aside our selfish ambitions and seek the goodwill of all. Work in this church and in all churches everywhere the miraculous unity of Pentecost. In the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.